Hi, I'm Benito Huerta, Director of the Gallery at UTA, University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, we're here today because we are featuring the work of Mel Chin in the gallery. Uh, the show opened uh, January 24th and will be up to March 30th. I hope you all can make it. Uh, we have here the artist Mel Chin, who's from uh, North Carolina, originally from Houston, Texas. And um, we would like, we're here to uh, talk with him about uh, some of the work that's in the show. Uh, welcome to uh, Arlington, Mel. Yes, it's good to be back. <laughs> I can't say it's always good to be back in, in Tejas, but no. uh, judging from all the things that are happening, but it's good to be here with you and continuing this inescapable history. That's our association after how many years has it been? 36, 40 something years? Uh, of our, our friendship, uh, it's uh, been about 46 years. 46 years, yeah. so, and um, knowing that um, Benito had curated me in an exhibition that traveled all over the United States. It's about 25 years ago. Yes, 25 years ago. It was called the same title. Mm -hmm. And so why uh, title something the same way is because it's true. Yeah. I mean, it's not just the inescapable histories of the, of the works that are being considered, but our own. So I, felt right. I was honored to be asked by you, Benito, so, to be part of this. So and I, I feel very proud of the show and having you here in the gallery oh, and yeah. your work, which is amazing. And uh, speaking of inescapable histories, I think that there's a few pieces I'd like to talk about, and that would be one of them since it is a yeah. title work for the show. Yes, yeah. Yeah, Inescapable Histories it was a commentary during the time where uh, uh, the 80s, when there was a lot of dialogues and in, in the city. I was living in New York City, city at the time. And uh, there was a lot of talk about theory and these ideas of what art could represent. One of the things that I, I felt was important is to have, uh, I guess one of the terms is agitprop which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, agitation, I guess, propaganda art. But uh, my concern was, is, is there other ways of doing it, other ways to make commentary about intractable conditions in the world of politics and history? Mm -hmm. And um, this one uh, was created reflecting on the, the agony that is the, the cause of the Palestinian uh, people and the relationship with the more militaristic wing of the Israeli government. And uh, looking at the, this piece uh, from a long view, it's actually uh, a piece of Hebron marble that I collected from a rock dealer from Israel mm -hmm. that's been carved or blasted into the shape of the, of the, the, the state of Israel. And the West Bank has been incised out, and clasping it is a sling mm -hmm. that's woven in the manner of wool that is uh, from the period of when the original kind of confrontations between Palestinian and the Israelite was, was David and Goliath. Right. It's an inverted kind of a review of this, how, how David used the very probably same kind of rock to, to battle the Goliath. Uh, with a sling. Mm -hmm. Now we have a inverse kind of situation where you have uh, the Palestinians at the time being subject to the to the rubber bullets, real bullets, and, and bulldozing of, of their lands right. and fighting back with just stones. So this kind of kind of inverse nature of inequality was was what it's about. So you have this piece, if I want to describe it, is this this place, I guess, represented in this kind of physical mapping, crawling across a wall, destroying the very fabric of the wall by being dragging through it mm -hmm. and scarring the wall. And it's sort of like a clock. It's a, at the time that, again, the sling is not free to be released. And it's, it's staked down. The stake is a stake actually of olive wood. Uh, emblematic of peace, and it's trapped that sling to keep it from moving and releasing, and yet it's trapped within its the the the, the West Bank, which is an area that still to this day is questioned. Um, the the whole right to representation as a state that is still being denied by the Palestinian people. This the depiction of the Palestinian people as a unified terrorist 
group. And these are individuals that probably were living in this land for a couple of thousand years mm -hmm. uh, before. And how more recent human rights organizations like Betselem have isolated the ethnic cleansing of these of, of the Palestinian people. This is, a, is an Israeli human rights group looking at the, what's going down. And through, it's about these properties. Uh, it's through real estate development. So, but anyway, a piece like this is a piece that you don't want to make. You know, it was a time where you create, I think some of these works, many of these works that you may ask about are works that I had no really de real desire to make. Because why would I want to make work about such tragic and intractable kind of situations. And an ongoing one at the same time. Exactly. That's not, yes, it's yeah. Not, it's it? not over. So it's a piece that I said that, uh, well, I'll make this, and that was 1988, and, uh, and you brought it around the country, and it was hoped that maybe someday this piece could be decommissioned in a way, mm -hmm. that, but it still has not happened. No. So, so this is, uh, unfortunately, the real true kind of situation. So, so I'm glad it's in this exhibition again, uh, showing here in this area, because I think we have to look a big picture of, of many things. Um, so that's one of the things that is, uh, you know, a lot of the works in the exhibition do deal with subject matters that are sometimes difficult because of the circumstances in which they are coming out of. And, and some of those um, uh, are usually created in the case of inescapable histories where the, the materials you're using are relevant to the subject that you're uh, dealing with in the, in the work itself. Um, one of the things that uh, is interesting is the piece here about uh, Vincent Chin. Uh, right. A lot of people don't really know what sometimes that is. A lot of people see the bats. They yeah. see the flag of the Japanese uh, nation. And, um, but they don't realize sometimes the story behind that. And when I've uh, had a couple of people here the other day who uh, really liked that piece, but didn't really know much about right. it. And so I told them the story of uh, Vincent Chin being mistaken as a Japanese individual. Right. But the, the, the same thing is the relationship of the last name You're right. to you. Yeah, well, we're, we're not related. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, that is a tragic story. We're related in, in the trials of, of being uh, a person of color in America. Mm -hmm. uh, we're related in that profound sense, especially now, unfortunately, with the increase of anti-Asian attacks that are being perpetrated all over America. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, the story of Vincent is one of the sad ones where uh, he's an adopted child, uh, he's an American, working as an engineer for the auto companies. Uh, he's celebrating his, uh, his upcoming wedding at uh, like a bachelor party at some strip club in Detroit, I don't, you know. And he's confronted by two disgruntled auto workers that this is night, back in 1986, I believe. I, I'll get the dates right, but it was back then, 84. And he's, he's confronted as a Japanese taking away their jobs, uh, I guess with the rise of the automotive Japanese industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I kind of have this parallel feeling about Vincent because he would be like me. If I was confronted, I would push back. Right. I would not like shy away and say, uh, forget about it, you know. He was attacked and he pushed the man down. He was aggressive, you know. Um, you fight back. You don't, don't put up with that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then they, they let it go and then uh, he's closing down the night. He's going to get married tomorrow and he's, he's at a McDonald's. And they track him down. And they, they even enlist someone else to come with him. And they have a baseball bat. And on that day, I think it was on the 19th of June, I'm trying to get the date right, they, they, they destroy him. I mean, they, they didn't kill him right now, but they, they beat him to the point where he dies a couple of days later. Oh. And then the sad part of that story is, is you have a situation that um, uh, it goes to trial and the piece, pe people are eventually, the people are the perpetrators, I think they are fined $3,000 and later they were right. acquitted. 
So there was never any justice for uh, Vincent. And so on the anniversary of that period, this piece was made. And I started thinking about all the associations about uh, the, the piece, with the piece, if you read Chinese, it's, it's you know, I, actually my father wrote the calligraphy, but it basically says, you know, uh, something to stir up the fans, you know, the setting sun fan, mm -hmm. which is emblematic of the Japanese, you know, association, the, the Nationalist Association. Um, 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 and, 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 and it's about all victims of racial violence. So you here you have this. Uh, I thought of this idea of this, this, uh, this baseball bat. That was probably a type that was used on him. Split into this fan that could open up, stretch with the best silk I could find, and then uh, drench with my own blood to make this commentary. And it's almost like this uh, mutative quality of objects to. To, you could fold it up and you would never know like uh -huh. how violence could be trapped in, how misassociations with uh, nationalism can give rise to these, these angers. And so it's a sorrowful piece in memory of him because I, I think, think that, I think this is the thing I'm going to talk about uh, making objects though. Make them with an intensity so you want to know what they're about. Mm -hmm. Like the people may not may have liked it or disliked it, but it should have enough strength to make you say, well, what it, could that possibly be about? What would it take to slice a bat like that? And why was it made with <clears throat> silk? And why is it filled with blood? You right. know? So these are the things that uh, I, I appreciate in trying to create. So in other words, creating a physical formal work that uh, can lead you to the piece, not necessarily tell the whole story. There's no text on it to say, this is what this is about, right. you know. So, but it seems that that's kind of, uh, in a sense, uh, from from knowing your work over the number of years, is that that seems to be a modus operandi in the, in the way that the work is crafted so beautifully that Thank it you. really lures you in just visually and makes you. And then once you start seeing what the materials are made out of, it starts makes you question what is right. this really about. Yeah, I think the lure is the right word. I've I've, I've kind of. Um, um, so use that kind of idea, like this, maybe like a Venus flytrap, mm -hmm. right? Something with some intense beauty, of course, if you're an insect or <laughs> or, uh, or or scent or something to bring you in. It, I think it's the obligation of, of certain pieces to have that formality or beauty, so you can begin to hold it in your mind. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is so much competition for iconography and images. You're always being mediated, usually by a commercial world. And so what can you create to compete with that? And I believe that uh, in making certain works that you need to compete on that level. So it can have something far different from what you're used to seeing. You right. see, that it would be uh, maybe to be held in the mind long enough so maybe later you can understand what it's about. Mm -hmm. That is worthy of being understood. So that's the poetic dimension that I look for, you know. Like there's poems I read when I was a kid that I probably would not understand. And then when you're now in my advanced age, I truly understand it too well, you see. Yeah. Um, along those lines, um, there's uh, two paintings in the show that mm -hmm. you actually completed while you were here <laughs> just a few weeks ago. Uh, but yet they have a relevance uh, to the area. Yeah. I come up with this long title uh, because it's the only way to describe it. Right. But it is about the persistent denial of white supremacy, basically. And uh, on the basis of their denial of what has happened um, in the history of America. And it's also about the resistance, uh, the, the deepening hue of resistance. Mm -hmm. of, uh, of the black culture and I guess any person of color against that. Yeah. I think you have to have, it's a confrontation between the two and it has a long history. I guess uh, this piece came about uh, with the knowledge of the Wide Awakes. The Wide Awakes was an 1860 movement that started in the East Coast in Connecticut, I believe that were Union soldiers that were young people. They were young, like a movement, 
that were against slavery. They were abolitionists and they started this very flamboyant kind of a dressing and, and uh, uh, outfits and were represented by this single eye that was wide awake. Mm -hmm. And this movement was uh, across the country because people began to understand their messaging. So it was an early kind of uh, resistance to slavery, right? It was during, and it was uh, pro-Lincoln at the right. time. Well, it got the word of this wide awakes eventually came to this area in the 1860s. And I think it might have been Denton, was just close by, right? Yes, or, it's north of us. Yeah, or even close to North Dallas, where this community, uh, there was a fire, and the people in charge, I guess, found it right to blame uh, the abolitionists and, and black people, or resulted in uh, uh, what they say, some say 30, maybe 100 individuals that were murdered or lynched because of that. And there's very little history on that. And it was called the Texas Troubles. They utilized this term close to where we sit. And why it was important maybe to even to finish the work here, because the impact, the emotional impact is long reaching. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that, I needed almost to be here to really absorb maybe the aura that used to be here, mm -hmm. that maybe still be here, that's still here, because I think, I think it's gone away. And the images themselves had to go back in time, because at the same time, I study uh, visual history and scientific history, and the depictions of uh, basically in the place of where the pupil would be would be the sun and the moon. And the sun, I felt, would represent white supremacy and the skin of white supremacy. And the, the moon would represent, it's reflecting, that it had to reflect against this is the, the growing, as I say, hue of resistance from people of color. And I think that's what was, was going on. I, so I took Galileo's description from 1620s of the sun and the moon and tried to replicate the look of that. And why would I go way back to Galileo? Because I said there's also this uh, denial of science that he was part of in the right. 1600s. And then you say, okay, then what other thing happened while he was publishing this book? It was the introduction to slaves into America. So you have two things that, that relate. The 18, so you have something from the 1860s and 1600s that I felt is a part of a longer history. Mm -hmm. So to do these paintings and using this, and you know, I'm not a painter by specific trade. I'm just an artist that would apply concept and say, this needs to be a painting. This can't be, this does not need to be a sculpture. So I, I sketched this out some, some time ago while people were talking about the wide awakes. And I said, well, eventually I would like to do this painting because it has to have color. It can't just be a graphical image, you know? And so the struggle was to depict what I think could be the diseased skin or the diseased look of, 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 of white supremacy. And then what is the deepening hue of resistance of an African-American, you know, of someone who was enslaved and, and someone who is now fighting to, for the right that is duly owned, you know, an ode to them. So you have this kind of relationship of, uh, of trying to just depict it in some honorable way. And the way it's painted, and the way it's organized, uh, I'm glad that I was working with you because we hung it high so you would almost view them as, as looking down upon you. Mm -hmm. And we'd space them like, well, like eyes looking down. So they, these are still, a, unfortunately, these are not just the eyes of Texas are upon you. This is the eyes of of just a horrible kind of presence right. that, that, you know, because it's both. Why would you even need this, this moon reflecting resistance? Because you have this other thing emanating this horrible kind of reality. So I think it's one of the great tragedies of being American is to still have to deal with this. Uh. One of the things that, um, to me, just kind of segues into another piece, another work that's actually behind us uh, called mm -hmm. SAFE, because mm -hmm. uh, it kind of deals with some similar issues. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, 
I think both these pieces are safe. Is and that's a short title. <laughs> yes, so I can remember yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, safe was was you know is a lamentation. I think that certain things happen before you're you're born, and mm -hmm. and but they they resonate. I mean, remember being very moved in high school, reading "Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee," and being very sensitive to the atrocity of what it is to be, to really begin to understand the American experiment has not been fair to many. So Adam Hochschild's book, "Leopold's Ghost," came upon me, and um, uh, it's about the the earliest. Be the first genocide of the 19th, 1900s of the 20th century, which was in the Congo, where 10 to 20 million Africans died under King Leopold II. The ironies were all over the place. You know, the story is about how, uh, and what's got me onto this was looking at a New York Times Magazine article explaining some of the, the issues in Africa as be, be, being tribal. I totally rejected that uh, description because of understanding what these books of history that correctly convey the horror that the horror, the horror that that um, was ascribed in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness was real. That there was a, a reality behind these things that are not fiction, and um, apparently, and it's related to everything. It relates to like the rise of industry of rubber. And you have a poor country like Belgium and a king that decides to end who, it's, this is the irony, King Leopold II is celebrated for ending the Arab slave trade. He kicked them out. But the other part of the story is he replaced it with his cruelty of hand cutting and lynchings and, and, and forced labor and the whole continent of Africa, and especially in the Congo. Mm -hmm. He made the Congo his own free state. He called it the free state yep. of the Congo. And he exploited it to the maximum level that enrich, enriched you know, Belgium to a global power level because of these materials. So that exploitation came with extreme tragedy. And it's heart-wrenching to go through the book and find out there's only a few brave people that would bring this up. So what to do as a, as a piece like this, I, I, uh, I started to, again, assemble everything I knew about King Leopold, from his crest to his, the, the free state uh, uh, shield and all that, and then studied the art. What kind of art do you make out? So I decided to do what they call make a trophy frame, which is not a great frame, it's like all, uh, uh, ostentatious kind of frame that was made usually by conquering powers, always in gold or something, right. and some painted landscape of the the people that are subjugated, happy in their labor, and the conquering heroes are there to so-called free them. Mm -hmm. Again, this kind of horror of colonialism. So I did that painting. I did that painting, which is based on a Belgium bond that related to the free state, split it in half and did a very bucolic, I promise you it's behind the painting. <laughs> it's, on, it's on Belgian linen, yeah. it's done in oil, it's another, it's weird, it's another opportunity to do a painting, but then I had to add something else. Uh, so I went through uh, my neighborhood, which is the mountains of Appalachia, and found a crumbling barn and I negotiated to get wood that has looked at the sky for a hundred something years. I looked for a barn that was built maybe during that period. And then I collected those, that wood, and then that was weathered and, and, and decayed, and I, I, I carved the top of it according to the river of the Congo that is like so the crown. that shape? That shape is the map of the Congo River. And, and then I put him, I said, it came to most in a dream, the way to do this. And always been a fan, or being inspired in this case by African art, like many artists, that whether they said it or not, mm -hmm. like Picasso or anybody right. else, uh, you have to. You look at this art of incredible culture, and if you're not inspired, then something's wrong with you. 
But looking at that, I was looking at the Nakondi figurines and look at the poignancy of a true community spirit of saying, we we'll make these figurines and we'll put this piece of iron in it to steal our relationship. We'll pound this and say, this is a way of bringing safety to my community. I make a deal with you. But in this piece, I'm saying no matter how many nails they, you could drive, you could never stop the horror of what was to come from behind, this free state of the Congo, Leopold II. So this is a lamentation to all of them. So all the, what we, we treated about 500 pounds of nails and we began to drive them in on to make an intense field that is way, uh, full of weight and full of belief that it could protect and maybe penetrate those boards and get and tear up that, that view. Mm -hmm. But I made sure in this case, because it didn't happen, none of those nails touched the canvas, this image. And so this is another way of creating a painting not to be seen, but is part of <laughs> uh, a whole thing. But, uh, it's how much intensity you put into something, I guess, is what's about as well. Because, uh, again, you're, you, you can't read the stories and not be moved to say, I have to do something. Well, the, 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 the number of nails and the weight of the nails you know, just amplifies that intensity of the subject. And it just, yeah. this is, it's a really powerful piece in that regard. Uh, you're talking about the frame. It was, uh, when we were installing the show, it was referred to as a trophy frame. <laughs> yes. So it's kind of like, you know, this is for King Leopold. It was like this was, this land was a trophy, but it was a trophy in the sense of like it was bringing them money yeah. by, on the backs of the people who were living there. Yeah, that's the term, actually. They, it's not high art. It's, it, uh, it's meant to be uh, celebratory only to the ones that are the subjugators. Mm -hmm. that want to depict themselves as uh, liberators or, or the, the, the absolute opposite of what it is, you know? And we find that a lot still. So all these things are applicable to this day. Yeah. I just hope not to do any more. There will be, there's always more lamentations and you want to be in the spirit of creating the conversation of options so that somebody way beyond an artist can prevent. Right. Yeah. You know. um, seems like a lot of the works in, in the show are kind of like lamentations. But one of the things that there's, there's I think, uh, three pieces in the show that actually have uh, either guns or the image of a gun in them. Oh, but, no. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I don't know why, but. Uh, but one piece, actually, um, that's in the show that's uh, called Internal Medicine, Homie So Nine. Right. It's a very different kind of... Uh, right. So uh, I know there's a sculptural version of this, but right. uh, it relates to that sculpture. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the piece is called Homie So Nine is a Glock 9 millimeter handgun. And I, I took one. Um, um, I think it was for, originally exhibited at the Whitney Museum, mm -hmm. it's owned by the Whitney, and it was an exhibition that Thelma Golden, the curator there, uh, created called Black Male. And when she asked me to be part of it, I said, I, not being a black male, obviously, but maybe I could produce these uh, accessories. And one of the things in hip hop culture, when you, you might be listening to Snoop Dogg and you hear, uh, pump, 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 and you'll hear a uh, little Malik or a little Hershey Lock say, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm strapped on your block with my Glock, ready to let loose on any imitator that I spot. And the Glock is in reference to the Glock 9 millimeter handgun, the, the 9 millimeter. Now, why is the 9 millimeter such a fascination? And to me is that it was also the same gun used in when Giuliani was the mayor of New York, where 47 bullets were pumped into a Mr. Diallo, who was stopped mm -hmm. by police, and he, they asked to show his, uh, he, he thought he was being robbed, and he held up his wallet, and they shot him 47 times. And a majority of those bullets were a 9 millimeter handgun. And then you start researching why the Glock, why the Gat, why the 9, <clears throat> why did I pick that to transform? Because uh, 
Of course, it was being promoted by uh, the Glock Glen Manufacturing as marketing miracle, according to the most, of how it took over the imagination of uh, gun owners in mm -hmm. America. In fact, I think a Luby's in Texas, here we go again, mm -hmm. was one of the first sites of a, uh, of a um, mass killing was perpetrated with a Glock 9 millimeter. So I do my research first, and mm. then I look at that, and then, then I realize that the, there's a, the, the scholar Walter Benjamin speaks about aura. Like things, uh, we're in Texas. Is there some kind of aura about guns <laughs> that I don't understand, or I do understand? Because how much it, it consumes the, the imagination or the needs of human beings is so that what every child in, in Texas may have four, possibly four handguns or yeah, weapons. It says, yeah, yeah, it's pretty profound. That, so the aura of this wep of weaponry or the need for this mm -hmm. is, uh, not, does not need to be stated. Over, you know, uh, it doesn't need to be overstated. It is powerfully right. there. But in, so, in this case, you're actually transforming. That's right, because sometimes transformation so knowing it was impossible to transform the aura of a gun mm -hmm. uh, by I said what can art do I said well I'll do it internally so for that work I, I, I took a, a bought a Glock and um, cored it out with a machine shop took out every part of it on the inside so it's almost a hollow shell it's the, the hollow shell of a Glock 9 millimeter, and then retrofitted it with a little saline magazine for a saline injector, uh, a FM radio transmitter, so you can take it apart and the battery would kick in and it would, you could call for help. And it had a oxycodone hydrochloride for pain. It had a ACE bandage, epinephrine, and auto injector that you could get into yourself and um, uh, if your blood pressure is dropping, and a 14 gauge angio catheter, because when your lungs are feeling, uh, filling up and you're about ready to die, you're, you're undergoing what is called uh, tension pneumothorax problems, and you jab that catheter in here, and it can give you a possibility of yeah. life. So it's a, it's a complete gunshot kit, trap, trauma kit, trapped within the shell of what would do the problem. So it is a commentary on secret or covert transformation necessary in our society. A, is, it had to be a real working emergency kit. So the drawing is one of the few drawings that show all the parts of the medical kit. Mm -hmm. So you would understand what was in the gun. Um, you know, when it's displayed, you usually have the artifacts. And, and people mistakenly would look at that and say, oh, Mel's doing a drug uh, delivery kit, <laughs> which talks about the views of basically uh, to about what gun culture and drug culture is about. You know? However, this one is one of the few drawings that can show the whole deal. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. So. But what I like about this piece is that on, on, on the surface, you could, for, for somebody who's in the street, they could look cool because they got their Glock, but at the same time, they're really being good because they know that they could save somebody's life. Well, that was one of my, some of my descriptions of it, like just knowing the street, uh, not, you know, I'm not a member of any gang or anything, but knowing the street, sometimes the, the being armed or whatever is a way of deterring things mm -hmm. in, in some people's imaginations. And being, you could, so having the aura of the gun was what this is about. Yeah. So it could actually uh, be something that it, it would show that, yes, you're loaded and you're strapped on the block, but you could possibly save somebody's life instead. Yeah. So it's the inversion of things. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you kind of do that with another work, uh, Night Wrap. Oh yeah, Night Wrap, yes, <laughs> of course. Night Wrap is, was in the same exhibition and I studied the type of nightstick that was used in Rodney King that perpetrated you know, the, the whole uh, Rodney King kind of reality. <clears throat> it's a Monadnock PR24, a polycarbonate uh, uh, nightstick. And I took that nightstick, I, I, I cut off the tip of it and added a wireless microphone 
uh, Audio Technica T32 at the time, very popular one, hip hop stars, and it's functional. So the body is filled with batteries, right? And you click it on, and you can amplify your voice instead of striking somebody. I always thought that the choice of creativity, it, if creativity is a choice, then I felt the piece is like, it's not when you hit somebody or sing to somebody, maybe it's having that possibility of choosing between those two things is mm -hmm. where a creative possibility might lie. You know, when the piece was made, yeah, it was, it was understood that you know, it could, it was, it's live, and we don't have a live one here, but usually it's, um, it's live mic, and you can you can you can sing into it instead of swing at somebody. Right. Yeah. So that that transformation is interesting. And the, again, always look into the historical uh, uh, relationship. And the the image, the nightstick, did not come out of out of the air. It, it, it was it is based on a uh, Okinawan uh, farm tool. That's eventually it's called the tanfa. The tanfa was used as a rice threshing uh, farming unit implement. And it is said after the samurai class came in and, and took over Okinawa, they forbid the farmers or the people there to have any swords or weapons. Oh, really? So they, yeah, they took farm tools and created the system of self-defense and offense out of farm tools. So when Bruce Lee is using the, or the 960s these are like farm tools. Mm -hmm. that, so you, what, I, what I'm saying is that subjugation, colonization, uh, uh, repression causes maybe a counter creativity, creativity, a transformation again. So the, the, the final transformation could be a work of art, you see? So in their case, that transformation are taking ordinary materials that could actually protect themselves with. Exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, the Tanfa is, uh, I mean, that's one story. I mean, you might mm -hmm. find another, but, you know, it seems like, um, it seems like to me it's a poetic reasoning mm -hmm. trying, you know, behind the invention of this kind of uh, uh, defensive weapon, right. or in this case, offensive weapons if necessary. You know, here they got the guns, the swords, <clears> and you, you got your farm stuff. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's a, uh, and you know, again, that's about the transformation again to art. That's, that's right. what these mutations are about. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, speaking of transformation and mutations, um, and in the sense of invention, is the uh, room installation of the oh. Funk and Wag from A to Z. Wow. Yeah. Because well. that's. That room is really intense because of uh, the amount of work that's in that room. But could you, a lot of people don't understand what uh, Funk and Wag even yeah. relates to nowadays. Yeah, so. well, uh, the Funk and Wag, Wagnalls was a popular uh, encyclopedia uh, that was probably from the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. 50s when it was, it was put into stores usually in poorer neighborhoods that could not afford the World Book or the Britannica. That's a costly proposition, right? But these were like uh, very economically produced published books that uh, you could go to the store, buy your groceries and almost and get buy one for like 99 cents, about one volume. Mm -hmm. So you can build your encyclopedia um, uh, in your own home, you know, and it was, it was for the working class or uh, different kind of masses that would not afford the education of, you know, the, or the money for a, a full set. So uh, I, my parents had a store in Houston, and I think they might have, um, I always wanted, I was somewhat precocious as a child, I really thought, man, I got to have Got to have an encyclopedia. That's how you have information. <laughs> I'm in the fifth ward of Houston. Yeah. And, you know, the internet and, of his time. <laughs> yeah, and there was not much. And um, we eventually, by the way, got a world book. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, my nickname, in, uh, was it elementary or junior high, was WB, world book, because <laughs> I had information that was needed when people wanted to cheat <laughs> on their tests. I said, well, the answer is this. And I tried to 
memorize things that yeah. help people. From, uh, in other words, to keep from being bullied. They said, "Don't beat him up because he might give me an answer." <laughs> you know. Uh, however, the Funk of Wagner's house is totally fascinated with this concept, and uh, it never made it to my parents' store. You know, we didn't have the economy, or mm -hmm. the neighborhood didn't have the economy for them to be interested. But however, somehow, uh, my parents got one copy of maybe volume two. And after they died, I was cleaning out the house, and I found one. And it was a profound moment where I was thinking about both of them. And I pulled it out, and I just started to cut it up. And there was, there was just some, maybe a knife in there, and the drawer, and a glue stick. And I began to paste together something, because I felt like out of their death, out of the end of things, something can live. And that became the purpose of this. It became, the, uh, it was, I was driven to this idea that the images um, that were in this entire uh, book maybe have died. Their, your books are being discarded. They're no longer relevant. I said, how can you use art or contemporary art to make it live again? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was maybe the point of the piece is to, 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 to liberate these images, very cheaply produced black and white images, and put every bit of invention I could to re-edit the entire volume into a living document. And that is the purpose of the Funk and Wag from mm -hmm. A to Z, is to take what is uh, essentially entrapped by the caption or its time and use uh, uh, the power of art, if you want to use the word power of art, or the capacity of art to, to make it live again. Right. So that is, that's what's so funky about it. And, mm -hmm. and then I got into it and had to get to all the volumes and, and begin to uh, have a very rigid structure of organization. Now you have to cut out all the pages uh, all the images out of the pages, and the exhibition has all the books I cut it out of. Mm -hmm. Cut all the scrap, maintain the scrap, don't throw anything away. Uh, just in case someone accuses me of uh, destroying books, I could say, no, you buy this insulation, I can glue it all back together for you. <laughs> you can have the complete yeah. set of the Funk and Wag, mm -hmm. if, uh, Funk and Wag mm -hmm. knows. That might take longer than it uh, took to create Really, it. yeah. But the rule would be to take out one volume at a time, and to see what I could do. And it's a way of exercising your creative, psychological, political critique. All those things can then be utilized. And so it becomes a full portrait of yourself uh, because you are making this meditation on information that has been gathered on this uh, encyclopedic level. Mm -hmm. And to represent it in, in a whole uh, mausoleum, I guess, of life, of, of life of ideas and images that uh, you have the power of a, of a perceiver or a creator to liberate things from their entrapment. Yeah. And that is what uh, the Funk and Wag was somewhat about. Mm -hmm. you know? you know? A very personal experience. It is. Yeah. And, and, and through, uh, I, guess I was going to, I'm, you know, sometimes I wear a patch of my eyes, you know. I've been suffering from a lifelong problem with double vision, and it be, as it became more intense, I decided, you know, you rebel against your own body or whatever. I, I thought I'd do the most labor-intensive, eye-straining thing I could do, mm -hmm. and is to carefully hand-cut images and not destroy this very fragile paper and repurpose them in a way of expression, you know. Yeah. And so it was a, it took a long time to do. Um, I'm going to probably try to end this on, on, on this, um, maybe like some of these last works, but <clears throat> a lot of the work in here is, is work that you, you've pretty much done on your own, but there's, there's work that's here, and it's actually uh, kind of in, in, in the films that we're showing here, right. and which are made with other people, and particularly the, the first film that I want to talk about, because it was one that I saw years ago uh, when you actually, when you first did it, is 9-11, 9-11. Yeah. And, and because there's, in this case, you're actually working with a lot of different people, not only in this country, but also in Santiago, Chile. Yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about 
you know, how that began, because we also have these preparatory, or uh, actually not preparatory, they're the, they're the drawings, the cell cells, drawings yeah. for the, the animated film. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, sometimes you, you, you have to uh, uh, give up your hand to give other hands to get, a, get hands from others. And this is an interesting piece because, of course, uh, the history of 9-11, everybody knows, mm -hmm. but only the, one of them, it seems. The one that happened in 1973 in Santiago, Santiago Chile, uh, is not as well known. I don't think it's within the historical American history book yet. But uh, the American government was responsible for the, the covert and then overt takeover of the country of Chile. And the, it ended up with the suicide, they say, but probably the assassination of the president, Salvador Allende, mm -hmm. in 1973. And the installation of uh, Pinochet who was the, the dictator that produced fear throughout South America and is probably responsible for 40,000 disappeared citizens uh, throughout South America. Uh, he was our person that the American government put in. And uh, on the day of 9-11 um, in, in Chile, after the presidential palace was attacked, we can find parallels to this, but mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, 3,000 uh, left-wing thinkers were rounded up and they were executed or tortured to death in the, the stadium, almost the same number of the people that perished in the 9-11 towers. So uh, when 9-11 happened in New York, I was aware of that history, but of course the one that happened in New York was foremost in my mind. I remembered. Uh, going to the site, uh, walking with the museum director, and we're walking toward Ground Zero, and the, I was looking at the photographs of all the individuals that people were looking for. And it was very sad and very disturbing. And I, I couldn't even get to Ground Zero. I had to stop. I remember what I said. I said, oh no, now, now hope must be eradicated somewhere else. I knew that the 9-11 that happened in America would be the cause for war, and it would kill many people. And so I was driven to tell a story or do something, and it took a year. On the anniversary of 9-11, I passed out a graphic novella called 9-11, 9-11, uh, written in a pseudonym, mm -hmm. uh, and passed out freely to young people because I wanted other people that would carry on knowledge to have this alternative uh, the reality, or actually not alternative, but actually reality that there's two 9-11s, that, one that we caused and another one that is much more complicated about the dynamics that were up to, up to that time. And why I had to search for a, uh, uh, um, collaborators in Chile was I was reading the, the Freedom of Information Act had released some papers of the time. And it has uh, Henry Kissinger speaking about the American government hand must be well hidden, that we have to hide what we're doing. And I said, okay, it's time for the Chilean hand to be shown. And I have to have help Mm -hmm. and have to find an animation team somewhere in Chile to help me do this because I wanted their hand to be part of the story. And it was the right call. You know, it won the best prize in animation when we finally did it in 2007. Um, it won the, the, their country's Oscar of the top animation prize of its time. And the animators, uh, we're very proud to say that their story is finally being told. You know, if you go to Santiago, Santiago Chile, there's September 11th Avenue that basically was put up by Pinochet to celebrate his, his takeover of the country. So it's a very weird thing to yeah. be in. And how time has passed and how that very, for a long while, the right-wing government uh, that was established, suppressed information to young people. 
And I feel like in America, maybe that same story is, is here, you mm -hmm. know? So doing that film was, was a, a very complicated and not a popular thing to be doing. To, uh, it was not a critique, that's why I wrote it as a love story that's uh, is intertwined with people that are involved with both 9-11. Right. So I'll let you have to watch the film to figure out what happened. Yeah. But, but anyway, yeah, sometimes it is not only important, you must bring in the hand of others and you must collaborate. It's, um, I think that I'd like to end on that note. Um, <clears throat> I think this has uh, been really insightful to hear about uh, what goes behind the work, yeah. uh, because a lot of times when people are looking at art, um, they're you know curious enough, but and then it's like you know there, there's a lot more to what's there, and I think that this work is just um, has so much depth uh, conceptually as well as visually and conceptually. Yeah. So I think that the uh, this is a, a good um, conversation for people to hear um, from about the work that you've done that's in this, exhibited in the show, uh, which is, again, will be up to uh, March 30th. I uh, hope you get to see it. We also have uh, the 9-11 uh, kind of uh, book here as well. Yeah, it's a graphic so, novel. It's graphic available. Novel. I think it's $9.11, yeah. isn't it? So, yeah. uh, bring exact change. <laughs> yeah, I want to so. thank you, Benita, for asking me to be part of this show and being a great curator and friend for so many years, uh, allowing me to be here with you. Well, it's, it's an honor to have you here too. Uh, and it's, a, it's wonderful to have your work here and for people to see the work and to ask questions about it. That's right, right thank, on. So thank right. you. Thank you. And thank you all. <laughs>